Yes, yeah, so thank you. I'm really excited to kind of chat to you guys actually and get some um, sort of input and questions. Um, I did some PPI at the very beginning of this sort of work, um, but I'm now a couple of kind of years in, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not now that I'm actually up and running, whether or not some of the sort of same similar issues and questions um, sort of come up. Um, I've got a very long title, but essentially means I am a uh, sister in the um, paediatric intensive care um, at Southampton Children's Hospital. So that's intensive care for children, um, part of my time. Um, and then the other time I am doing a PhD. So, oh, it won't let me go forward. Oh, let me try it that way. Next. Okay. Here we go, fab. Um, so I worked in uh, intensive care for on and off for about sort of 12, uh, 13 years. Um, as I say, I met, met Caroline when I was a research nurse in the clinical research facility at Southampton about, yeah, six, seven years ago. So I'm, I've sort of dabbled in a bit of research, but I've always done other people's. Um, so this um, opportunity to do my PhD and do my own research was um, really exciting. And essentially, yeah, I'm in my third year. Um, um, with potentially two more years left to go. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, um, the admission rates, um, so the number of children that are being admitted to intensive care is growing year on year. Um, what that looks like, um, essentially every single day, 55 children are being admitted to a intensive care unit um, in, the, in the UK, and it's a massive cost to the, the NHS. But the great thing about um, the advancements in technology and the treatment and what we can sort of deliver now in the NHS, the majority of these children um, are being home, uh, are being discharged alive. So, um, but a lot of these children do go on to have multiple kind of health needs and problems um, once they are discharged. And actually the research historically was about how can we keep these children alive? What can we do? Whereas now it's about actually these children are surviving, but what does that look like? Um, when they go home, what problems do they have? Um, and that is where the kind of emerging research um, is. And that's sort of what, what my project is looking at. Just to give you an impact. Um, so I, with my time being a children's nurse and looking after these babies and these children, I've seen firsthand the horrible but necessary kind of procedures that we do to these babies. And as you can see in this picture, a lot of it does involve the kind of nose and the mouth. There's lots of tubes. We do lots of um, horrible kind of procedures and suctioning and put in tubes, take out tubes. And a lot of this is to do with their sort of nose and their mouth. And, and I've, you know, kind of looked after these babies and these children and they really struggled to eat and drink um, afterwards. So that sort of made me question, well, actually, um, at me as a nurse at the bedside does the things that I do to them um, affect how they can eat and drink and actually there's been some really nice research that these babies during their small admissions have up to 89 different procedures that are painful and invasive um, even for those that just are in the intensive care for a, a few days so it made me kind of think well actually what is the impact of that on their ability to eat and drink when these especially these teeny tiny babies that should be learning to eat and drink when they're first born or children when they're sort of four to six months whether or not actually if they're really ill and they should be learning to start taking solid foods and tastes and textures what does that kind of impact and actually we're really mean um, when children are in intensive care we don't feed them um, you know we, we it's way down on our priority um, sort of list um, and therefore they miss lots of opportunities to kind of eat and drink. Um, and it made me sort of question, well, actually, does that impact their sort of successful feeding ability and future feeding skills? And there's been some really nice research that actually shows that children that are not orally fed, so potentially have a nasogastric tube into their tummy or fed via a sort of, a, they call it a peg in their stomach, um, those children that don't eat or drink normally, as you and I would, um, actually affects their neurodevelopment going forward and can have lasting kind of um, altered feeding behaviours, even into their sort of adulthood. So um, it made me sort of think, well, well, actually, you always start with what is already out there and what literature and what research has already sort of gone out there. So I dabbled in a bit of the research and there's lots of really nice evidence in adults. So um, if you and I, any of us, hopefully not, will um, ever go to intensive care, 
but just having two days of um, so intubation and ventilation. So that's essentially a tube down their throat to help them um, breathe um, and you're completely asleep and you're on a ventilator to help your lungs. Um, we would experience um, dysphagia, so swallowing difficulties. Um, our ability to eat and drink would be altered. Um, we would have very little appetite. And things that we enjoy the taste of um, just taste very different. It tastes very metallic, it's very odd. Um, and this can last up to three months, um, even once we're better and once we're home. Um, but there is no data um, or very little data in, in children. There's some really nice data on teeny tiny premature babies. So these are teeny tiny babies that are born perhaps at 25 weeks. Um, and there's some really nice evidence that, there's, that these babies, obviously, because they're very tiny and they're not meant to be out in the world, um, do have feeding problems. Um, and that can be up to 55 percent, up to almost all of them want, when they're going home, they have a problem with feeding. Um, and it's completely kind of, as well as the fact that they are brought born so early, it is affected to do with their intensive care stay. So how long they're on these tubes for, how long they're ventilated. Um, and there is a real kind of link between that and their feeding ability. There's some, also some really nice data about children with congenital heart disease. So these are babies that are born with problems with their heart that need surgery. Um, these children are often in intensive care. We often look after them. And again, there's some really nice data and a lot of these children have feeling difficulties. And a lot of it um, is related to, again, their ability once they get home to actually be able to take a bottle to eat normally. And again, um, it links between the length of time they're in intensive care and all the horrible things that um, we do to them and their types of surgery. But there is very little data on actually previously healthy children or other children that are admitted to intensive care. So that's a sort of gap of the evidence. Um, and that is what my um, study is looking to identify. So my research question is, do previously healthy young children, um, and I've, I've chosen kind of four years old um, as the highest, mainly because actually this, this is the time in which uh, children are not at school. So therefore, um, you know, when they're at school, a lot of their kind of, you know, their lunch and their food is sort of taken away from parents' control. Um, and actually this then kind of covers the teeny tiny babies that should be learning to breastfeed um, or bottle feed, um, the kind of four to six months where they should be learning to wean and eat um, different tastes and different textures. And also the delightful period, which my daughter was horrendous at, you know, that sort of two-year-old control where, you know, Last week, I loved lasagna. This week, absolutely not having any of it. Um, so kind of to, to get that kind of behavioral um, element. So do these children on this age range who survive critical illness, do they go on and develop feeding problems after their intensive care stay? <coughs> and what is that impact on um, parental feeding experiences, parental stress, and kind of that behavior between that bi-directional behavior between children and their parents? So um, I am currently, excuse me, two, two years into my um, longitudinal survey. Um, so COVID obviously had a massive impact, which I've got a nice slide that kind of demonstrates that. Um, it's a multi-center longitudinal. So um, I've got eight PICUs that are um, across the country that are recruiting for me. Um, and I'm involving a six month longitudinal survey so that I can identify uh, feeding problems at different time points along their journey. I am then um, collecting their medical notes review. So all the data about their clinical experience in intensive care. So how long they're on the ventilator for, how long they were fed, how sick they were, that sort of clinical data. And I've got some really nice um, parental interviews to kind of get that really kind of lived human experience. Sorry. Uh, next one. So um, I've got, I'm just showing this off because I love it. I spent a lot of time with my um, beautiful logo. Um, it just, you know, and, and the fact that it's a pie. Um, so, uh, yep, so these, these are the sites that I've got running um, and they're doing a fantastic job. Um, they're basically doing this out of love for me, um, which is absolutely brilliant. And they're really busy, um, amazing intensive care units. So the questionnaire, 
um, that I'm giving parents to complete um, basically looks at their feeding. Um, so what are they eating and drinking? Um, there's a, there's a um, and the other questionnaires, questionnaires are previously validated. They've already existed. So tools that have already um, kind of been published. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't created these questions myself. These are all already existing tools. Um, looking at parent, um, parental stress, the feeding difficulty, um, how parents feed their, their children and some child behaviour questionnaires. And essentially I give them out at recruitment. So when they're in intensive care, I approach families um, and if they're interested, they do a baseline questionnaire. So this was, how was it like beforehand? How was feeding before they became unwell? So that's my kind of comparison. Um, and then I repeat the questionnaires and I send them in the post or they can do them online at one month, three months and six months to see if I can identify acute problems and then how that kind of uh, that feeding kind of develops. As I say, these are the kind of notes um, and the data that I'm collecting about their intensive care stay. So these are all things that um, we think or I think might influence or impact feeding and which have been, you know, uh, brought out in other, other literature and um, other data. And these are the types of questions that I'm asking in the interview. Um, and this is just to kind of get that lived human experience. Um, you know, I'm very aware that when you have a questionnaire, you, I'm deliberately forcing people to say yes or no, or how much. Um, and actually you can't always get that experience and, and the different um, experiences and um, the whys. Um, so, so this is about, well, what was feeding like beforehand, that experience in intensive care, um, any kind of support that parents got and what was feeding like once they got home and, and really kind of understand that journey. Um, so recruitment so far has, um, so my, when I first started this and kind of got funding, um, my sample size was, um, was 300 families um, and I was going to open 12 intensive care units. Um, and then, as you can see, COVID happened. Um, so non-COVID research just didn't get approvals um, in NHS um, sites. So it, it was a year of kind of drip feeding um, centres that could open for me. Um, and then the research nurses all got deployed to work in um, adult intensive care units. Um, so it's been a real sort of struggle. Um, but it, and now, you know, as me, I'm a, I'm a prime example, you know, now that we're out in the world, everybody's sharing the love and the bugs. Um, so um, actually the last sort of um, six months of, I, you know, recruitment has, has gone, um, has, has kind of skyrocketed and I managed to get approval to um, carry on my kind of recruitment um, to try and get, yeah, to try and get closer to sort of 200 um, families um, to, to enable to get my primary outcome. Um, the next step, so uh, yeah, I've essentially got another six months to try and recruit as many families as I can, um, and then um, and and then another six months as a follow up. So another year of collecting data, and then my personal um, sort of PhD funding comes to an end in a, another year after that. So I've got um, another uh, yeah another twelve months to write this up um, and and publish and get my results. <clears throat> 